Uh, hey, let me uh, hear you if you've heard this phrase before. Put your money where your mouth is. All right, so I'm the only guy? I mean, come on. Let me hear you if you've heard the phrase before. Put your money where your mouth is. Okay, so now this phrase is often associated with some sort of like gambling in most people's minds, right? Uh, we think about that. And I, that's not the, we're not talking about gambling today, so don't, don't think that's the way we're going to end our series. But it's also a phrase that means kind of don't just talk the talk, but, but walk the walk, right? Uh, instead of talking about improving a situation and, or maybe complaining about a situation, maybe do something about it. That's kind of what that phrase means also. Uh, put it into action. Do something behind what it is you're talking about. It can also kind of be stated as, as put up or shut up, right? Uh, if you're like me, you've probably heard those phrases a number of times. Uh, my son, Tripp, my oldest of our four kids, we have three boys and a girl. Tripp is a little bit of a trash talker has to get it from his mom, um, because I don't know how else he would get that. I don't know why you're laughing. I feel judged here. Uh, but one day, we're, we're hanging out. We're kind of, it's just me and the, the boys. Uh, Libby's got Henley somewhere, and we're, we're doing some workout type stuff. Now, I'm just open, open book here, cards on the table. I'm a Nike Plus app guy. Like, it just I'm doing like hit interval training. Like I'm not doing a whole lot of working out. It's like a lot of interval stuff, a lot of like conditioning and some burpees and things like that. And so one day I'm working out and, and the two youngest boys, Paxton and Rhett, are there with me working out as well. And Tripp's like playing Fortnite on his phone or something like that, watching all three of us work out, right? And so it gets to the burpees section and Paxton is like, he's full blown into it. Now Paxton is kind of our He's our most athletic of the three kids. And so I'm like, okay, this is fun. He's doing it. Trip, sitting on the couch playing Fortnite, starts talking trash to him, right? And he's like, he's talking about his form and he's talking about, well, you're not going to finish it and all this kind of stuff. So I look over at him. I said, hey, why don't you put your money where your mouth is? You get over here and do it with us, right? <laughs> All of a sudden, it's a lot harder than Tripp initially thought, right? So Tripp gets through. He's struggling a little bit. He obviously could not put up, so he just kind of shut up and went back over to the couch, right? And so it was over there, and I was like, man, this is the real world of put up or shut up. Um, I think today, in ending our seven words that could change your life series, we're going to be talking a little bit kind of about a, a put your money where your mouth is type of word in, in some sense, very literal and literal. And we'll walk through that, but it's definitely kind of a, a put up uh, or shut up type of word. According to the scriptures, uh, today's word is generosity. Did you know that 7,000 promises of God in the Bible, 7,000, all of them come with a, a premise or like a condition. I'll do this if you do that, right? So they have these premises and conditions in the Bible. 7,000 promises. There is one that is glaringly above all of the other promises with the premise connected to it. And that premise is always in the form of generosity. There are more promises related to generosity in the Bible than any other subject that we see. And don't hear what I'm not saying, because the second I said the word generosity, you started thinking about Black Friday and all the Christmas gifts that you had to buy, and you think this is just a financial conversation. It's not. Generosity means so much more than anything just regarding financial. Uh, you can be generous uh, with your time. Uh, you can be generous with other resources that you have. You are generous with praises to people that you give. You can be generous with your energy that you spend with and around people. There's so much more that you can be generous with. How about your, your talents, just what you've been gifted at? But generosity is not just that financial matter. And in no other area in the Bible will you find a promise more connected to some sort of condition from God than with generosity. And as a matter of fact, I began studying some words of the Bible for this series, right? Seven words that can change your life. And so I'm like, okay, what are the major words of the Bible? Uh, major important words, right? Words like believe. Like we would consider that to be a very important word. It's found 272 times in the Bible. Words like pray. We talked about prayer last week. It's found 371 times in the Bible. How about words like love? We know love is a great word in the Bible that we need to dive into. It's found 714 times. And give, which is a, a form of generosity, same type of background of the word, it's found 2,152 times in 
the Bible. And, and I think that's because when we're generous, whether it's with our time, our talents, our resources, our energy, or whatever that may be, when we're generous, we're kind of putting our money where our mouth is. I, I think we're putting our faith into action when we are actually generous and living a generous life. And, and quite literally, if you leave here with anything today, I think we ought to all understand that generosity in its very simplistic form is nothing more than love and action. When, when we live a generous life, we are putting our love into action. When, when, when we're having a faith that we claim to have and we live a generous life, we're putting that faith and that love into action. A question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we generous? Would people describe me as a generous person? Not just do I give money or do I give my time or do I give my talents to places or do I spend time with people or do I use other resources that we have? But, but literally, would people classify me as a generous person? I mean, as we see, the Bible is very clear in claims of generosity that we're supposed to be living out. And I think today's passage that we're going to look at uh, is one of the best passages in all of the Bible relating to generosity. Uh, today, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 9, which is found on page 1028 of the Black Bibles that are scattered throughout the room. Uh, and as always, uh, if you don't own a copy of the Bible, we would love for you to have that one. I'm actually really excited, too. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have an app available that will have uh, a Bible on there as well, where you can open up a Journey Point app and actually have the scriptures on there. But if you don't own a copy of the Bible, please take that one with you. We'd love for you to have it. Uh, 2 Corinthians is actually one of three letters written by the Apostle Paul to the church uh, at Corinth. Uh, this is actually the third letter. Uh, the first letter was never found, but it was referenced. And then the second letter, not to be confusing, is actually 1 Corinthians. <laughs> I know, right? The second letter is 1 Corinthians, and then the third letter is what we're going to be in today in First Corinthians, I mean in 2 Corinthians 9. Um, and, and what happens is in that kind of first letter in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, kind of holding them accountable to some things that, that weren't going so well in the church. And really what happened was he lost some kind of love and affection from the people in Corinth that he had prior to writing that letter, right? It's kind of like when you tell people what you think, sometimes they don't like it, and then all of a sudden they don't like you anymore. Uh, that's what happened. But then Paul went on another visit where he kind of regained their love and adoration. And this letter is a little bit of kind of a thankfulness for the joy that he had, that they now uh, appreciated him again. But it's also a call for them to give an offering to the suffering followers of Jesus that were in Jerusalem. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago that uh, once everything kind of went down with Jesus in Jerusalem after his death and resurrection, uh, people that said yes to Jesus, followers of Jesus, were persecuted. And, and so what Paul was doing, this church plant that started in Corinth, was now taking an offering back to the main church in Jerusalem because of the suffering and persecution uh, that they were having. And so that's kind of what we find at the end of 2 Corinthians. And in fact, chapters 8 and chapter 9 of all of the Bible, most people, most theologians would consider chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians some of the best material that God gives us on financial stewardship just in general. Uh, and so that's where we are. And in the last part of chapter 9, we're finding Paul giving us some motivations for living a generous life. And again, not financially only, but with time, talents, resources, friendships, you name it, there are many other ways to live a generous life. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when it comes to being generous, I need all the motivation that I can get. <laughs> sometimes I get in my way when it comes to generosity, and I need all the motivation that I can get. So turn with me, 1028, we're going to pick up in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Read with me. It says, now the one who produces, provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. Verse 12 says, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the proof provided by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ 
and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. And as they pray on your behalf, they will have deep affection for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. And verse 15 says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that when we were really undeserving, you were very generous. God, that you did give us an indescribable gift. God, we're so grateful for that. And in a kind of a week of Thanksgiving, Lord, we just take time to stop and pause and say thank you. Lord, thank you for what we have for life and breath, for clothes, for jobs. God, for all that we take really advantage of. But we just stop to say thank you for being so generous with us. God, use this letter to a church in Corinth written thousands of years ago, Lord. Use it today to encourage us to live a life of generosity, to put our love into action. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I think when we read this, we're going to see there's three motivations that Paul gives at the end of this chapter for living a generous life. And the first one is this, generosity multiplies your wealth. Now, as some of you kind of crept back in your seat thinking like, hey, what, what are we talking about here? Uh, let me tell you what this is not saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying here. And let me first tell you what multiplying your wealth doesn't mean. You see, nowhere in the Bible do we find that God says that if you are generous, you're going to be uh, financially rewarded. Nowhere. Nowhere do we see that. Uh, nowhere does it say that if you do what he asks or if you obey his commands that uh, you will have a bigger bank account than you did before doing that. That's nowhere in the scriptures. What we do find, though, and what Paul tells us here is that uh, when we sow generously, we reap generously. Now, um, I am from Tennessee, but I'm not a farmer. I know some people that are not from the South. They just think that anybody from the Southeast or like they grew up on a farm somehow. Like I didn't. I'm actually from a big city, um, you know, and so I'm from there. So when I read this, I'm kind of like sowing and reaping. What are we talking about here? I mean, basically sowing is scattering the seed and reaping is the harvest that comes from scattering the seed. It's a basic principle. You throw out more seed, you're probably going to have a greater harvest than if you just threw out a little bit of seed, right? And so this can be misconstrued sometimes to say, hey, well, if I am more generous with my money, then I am going to get more money in return because I'm generous with my money. If I'm generous with my other resources, the, the things that I have, then I'm going to get a big harvest of resources back. Uh, if I'm generous with my time, then I'm just all of a sudden, like, things are going to be easy and time is going to be brought back for me. If I'm generous with my energy, then I'm just going to be renewed in a greater way. That, that may be true. That may happen to you. But nowhere is this the promise that God is giving. What it says, if you'll listen with me in verse 10, it says, Now the one who provides seed, the one here is God. The one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase your harvest of righteousness. Then it says you will be enriched in every way for all generosity. You see, any of us that are generous, we're acting on the premise that God is the one that provides the bread and the sower and that he is the one that multiplies the harvest, not us. You see, it's kind of like this, it's, it's crass economics, right? It's the rich get richer and the poor get poor. I mean, that's, that's a general principle that we see. And the same is true in generosity that leads to righteousness. Not any of those other things that we talked about, but righteousness is what Paul is saying. Uh, theologian and pastor, kind of European pastor uh, from the 1800s, his name was William McGregor. He said this, one of my, my favorite quotes about just kind of this thought that we have of being rich, right? He says, a selfish man is never rich. His day is as long as his neighbor's, yet he has no leisure except for his own amusements, no sympathy or concern beyond his own perplexities, no strength but to fight his own battles, and no money except for his own need. What haunts his mind at every turn is the dread of having too little for himself. God multiplies your harvest, but he multiplies not your material wealth. He multiplies your wealth of righteousness is what Paul is saying. Literally, you and I, the, the righteousness that we become, right? The, the good in us that we become, thanks to Jesus, only thanks to Jesus, 
works itself out through our generous life to others. Again, whether that be time, talents, or resources. You see, because generosity is ultimately love in action. Not love stored up, but love in action. It's, it's the love of Jesus that, that followers of Jesus have in them that makes its way out of them onto someone else so that they may have an opportunity to also say yes to Jesus and have his love in them. I read a story recently about two groups of people that went into Thailand. Thailand is a, a place where many people do not know the claims of Christianity and Jesus. And so these groups went into Thailand and they had two groups. They broke them into two areas. One they called the converters and another one they called the blessers. Okay, so you have the converters and the blessers. The converters were literally there. Their sole focus day in and day out was to go and tell as many people as they could about the claims of Christianity, hoping that people would put their faith in Jesus. And then you had the blessers were over here. The blessers were there for the community. They had regular jobs, and they were just there to bless the community, provide jobs for the community, serve the community, just be generous with their overall lifestyle and be blessers for the community. Here's what they found at the end of the time that they spent there. I think it was about a year that this study looked at. At the end of a year, not only did the blessers have more social impact in the community, they also had a 48 times greater likelihood of having someone say yes to Jesus than the converters did whose sole focus was to talk to people about Jesus. You see, when we live a generous life, it is our love in action, and it means that we have an opportunity to see a harvest of righteousness multiplied in and through our lives. See, God's promise is that he'll use us to have Others say yes to him through our generous life that we live and the instruments that he's given us to use. The instruments of his grace that he's given solely for us. And, and when that happens, I don't know about you, but I can't help to be thankful that God would decide to use someone like me. To, that he, would, he would say, in spite of Chris, I'm going to use him, and so I have to be thankful, right? Right? And I think that's the next motivation that we see from Paul. Uh, not only does generosity multiply our wealth of righteousness, but it also produces thanksgiving. Uh, look at verse 11 and 12 says, it says, you will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Generosity produces thanksgiving. And we're not just thankful because of our giving, but we're thankful to God for the ability to be able to give in the first place, right? I mean, if I have the opportunity to be able to give generously, then I should be thankful to God that I was able to give generously. If I have the opportunity to spend time with people and, and be generous with my time, I should be thankful to God that I had the time available in the first place to be able to spend with them. If I have talents that I can give generously to others, I should be thankful that God has given me the gifts that I can use to be able to use with other people in a way that I wouldn't be if God didn't give me those gifts. And I think sometimes, if we're just being honest, sometimes we, we are not generous because we don't think we have that much to give. Whether it's our time, our talents, our resources, we just don't think we have a lot to give. And can I let you in on a little secret? You have enough. Every single one of you. You have enough. Because when we live with the premise that we don't have enough, we're, we're almost ungrateful for what God has given us, and we're saying that he can't replace whatever it is that we're trying to give. That if we spend time with people, that he can't replace that time in some other way. That if, if we share our talents, maybe someone else will figure us out in some kind of way that he can't replace those talents that we have. If we give generously financially, that he's not going to be able to replace that financial means that we gave away. It's almost like we don't have a belief that he can do it. And, and speaking of even multiplying itself, when, when we do give, no matter what it is that we're giving, it becomes a thank offering to God that ends up multiplying itself, Right? We're thanking God for the ability that we're able to give this, and others are thanking God for the ability that they can receive it from us. Literally, it's a thank offering to God. 
Generosity is love in action. It's a love for God, thanking him for what he's given, and it's a love for others, thanking for what they have given us. And in this particular context of Paul's letter here, I am positive that suffering followers of Jesus that are amidst persecution would probably be thankful for the generosity that these Corinthians gave them, right? I mean, in fact, in in a world that we're trying to gain influence in everywhere we can, I, I mean, like, leaders across the board are trying to gain more influence in every area of their life. And do you know where you gain more influence? When you're generous. You gain more influence in people's lives when you are giving, not when you're just receiving. No one that you have a high esteem for is someone that you say, man, that person sure gets a lot, never gives, but he sure gets a lot. You see, literally, we gain influence as we give, not as we receive So generosity produces this thankfulness in us. I I guarantee you these Corinthians had a newfound group of people that were influential, right? That thought they were influential for what they were doing. And and in fact, I, I solely believe that there are people that didn't know who Jesus was or didn't believe in what Jesus did that were thankful for Corinthians that probably end up saying yes to Jesus in a way that they wouldn't have without the gratitude and generosity that the Corinthians had for them. This goes back to the first point, right? Multiplies the wealth of righteousness. Whether you know it or not, one of the amazing things about the generosity of those that make Journey Point happen is that there are people that have visited here because of the gratitude and thankfulness of those that allow Journey Point to happen. And and for those that have given back to God what is his through Journey Point, and, and we receive thank you after thank you for that. And there are people that have come and visited that had never heard the gospel before in their life that had said yes to Jesus because of the generosity of other people. I know they're thankful. I know they're certainly eternally thankful. I, I know that when they stand face to face with Jesus, they will be eternally thankful for the generosity of people that allowed this to happen so that they could hear the gospel for the first time. I mean, I I can't even, I'm not creative enough to make that kind of stuff up. (laughs) Your love into action brings people to visit here as a means of thanksgiving, as a gratitude that ends up changing their life forever. Are you grateful? Are, Are you thankful When you give of your time, your talents, or your resources, are you doing it out of compulsion or or out of necessity or because somebody told you? Are you doing it because of your thanksgiving to God that you have the ability to do it in the first place? That's what Paul's saying here. Generosity produces thanksgiving. And, and, And not only does it multiply your wealth or produce thanksgiving in your life, but ultimately the greatest thing that generosity does is it honors God. The last motivation that we see from Paul is that it honors God. And, and, and I don't know where you are on generosity. Maybe you're not a very generous person. I feel you. Years ago, I was that way. When I was in sales, I was a very stingy person. <laughs> my deal was if, if I give of my time, my talents, or my resources, then I'm not going to be able to do what I want, when I want, or the way that I want to because I'm giving away of whatever it is that I'm giving away. I was stingy and I was selfish. I really was. And ultimately, I think what I realized was that that was not reflecting of God's character, but it was really reflecting of my character. And what I realized was that my stinginess was, like we said a minute ago, just an unbelief. I was afraid that if I gave away, I wouldn't have what I wanted. I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to do the things that I wanted and that God wouldn't be able to replace whatever it was that I was giving away. As if God couldn't replace it, right? But what I did was I saw mentors that walked with me, that loved me, that put their love into action, that generously spent time with me. They were very generous people in more ways than one. And it shaped me so much. And, you know, that's an, another aspect of what generosity does. Generosity cures materialism. I mean, when I give, I want to give more. When, when I have the ability to give of my time, my talent, or my resources, like, I want to give more. It's like a drug, right? 
Generosity cures any of that stinginess or that unbelief. I, I realized that the greatest reason to be generous was because it honored God. And we should do things cheerfully. I mean, that's what Paul literally says, that we should do it cheerfully. He says it in verse 7. God loves a cheerful giver, not a reluctant one or one out of compulsion. Giving is literally what we call an act of worship, which is just reverence or thanksgiving back to God, honoring God. And it's a recognition that everything you have is God's anyways. I mean, look at what verse 13 says. It says, because of the proof provided by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. Literally, generosity proves that we worship something bigger than ourselves. Worship, like I said, just means reverence or honor to something. We worship a lot of things, but here we're talking about honoring and worshiping God. One translation says it this way. Uh, the New Living Translation says, For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. Your generosity honors God. When you give, you worship when you give up your time, it's worshiping God. Those that help Journey Point happen every week, it's part of what we call our dream team. Literally setting up, tearing down, working in kids, uh, shaking hands, doing all those types of things. They are generously giving up their time week in and week out. They're living a generous life. They're worshiping God through that. They're saying, thank you, God, for allowing me to be able to do this. I'm going to give back to you here through the gifts that you've given me. Those that give of resources, being financially generous. They're worshiping God and thanking them what he's given, given them. They're generous with their praise to others. They're worshiping God. They're thanking him for being able to be nice and kind in a world that doesn't seem so nice and kind and a lot of praise, right? You all, we're never more like God than when we're generous. Never. And we're closer to God when we're generous, Right? What I invest in, I'm interested in. If I invest my time, I'm interested in it. If I invest my talents, I'm interested in it. If I invest my resources, I'm interested in it. What I invest in, I'm interested in, and that means I'm being generous with God's gifts. It means I'm interested in God. And think about it this way. If God was not generous, we would have nothing. Life Breath, clothes, jobs, careers, friends. If God wasn't a generous God, we would have nothing. Ultimately, Jesus. I, mean, I think that's why Paul closes out this last piece. This is what he says. He says, and as they pray on your behalf, they will have deep affection for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Jesus in you. And then verse 15, Paul completely flips it. And says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. For his indescribable gift. Every single bit of our giving is done in light of the inexpressible and generous gift that God gave us through Jesus Christ. There, there's no other way to give than without a knowledge that we are giving because God is a generous God who sent his son when we were unworthy and unneeding, we, we were needy, but we were undeserving of his gift, right? And, and with no stipulations, which by the way, have you, ever, have you ever had the stipulations to your giving, right? I'll give as long as, I'll give my time with this person as long as I feel that they're gonna use it powerfully in their lives. I'll give of my talents as long as I think they're actually going to do something with it. We put stipulations on our generosity, and I am so grateful that God never put a stipulation on his generosity other than believing in his son, Jesus, because we were undeserving. We weren't going to use the grace of God like we should. There's nothing that we would have crossed a, a checkbox with of using it wisely, right? Yet God still gave Jesus for us to take our place. And he just simply said that, hey, if you believe that I sent my son in a very generous way for you, that he 
was murdered, was buried, and rose again, that if you seek a relationship with him and ask for forgiveness for living outside of the way that I desire, then your life is eternally changed. And as the the band comes back up, that's the greatest thing that we can process, the word that can absolutely change our life is to think of the generous God that sent Jesus to take our place. There was nothing we did to deserve it. There was nothing that we crossed a checkbox with that said, because Chris did this, I'm sending Jesus. Because he excelled in this area, I've given him this. But God generously gave his only son so that we could have eternal life with him. That's love in action. Generosity ultimately at the end of the way, day, whether it is your time, whether it is your energy, whether it is the talents that God gave you, or whether it is your resources that you have, generosity is putting love into action in our everyday lives so that others around us can see a harvest of righteousness can see a thanksgiving for what God gave us and that they could see without a shadow of a doubt that we are trying our best to honor God in all that we do. And so we're gonna go into a song and during the time of this song, I just want us to reflect. But we're getting ready to go into a time that like generosity is the last thing that you're thinking about. You have family and friends and end of year work related things to do closing out the calendar year closing out fiscal years everything is going to say you don't have time to be generous you don't have the resources to be generous you are not going to be able to be generous in this area because blank and as we go into this last song I just want us to stop and pause and say God help me fight that help me fight it Don't let me believe the lies that the world is going to throw at me that right now I can't live a generous life with any of the areas that I need to be generous in. Help me fight every ounce of what the world throws at us. In fact, let's just bow our heads and pray right now. Lord, there are people here that they've said yes to you. They're followers of you. And God, this is a hard area to overcome. Lord, I pray that right now you would just give them every burden lifted. God, that they could live a generous life like you've called us to. God, it looks different in each of our lives. Generosity is not the same, but the mentality is that we need to be giving of the things that you've given us, whether that be our time, our talents, or our resources. Father, I pray that in a season where Generosity seems like the furthest thing from our mind. God, you would help us honor you as Paul commands here with the Corinthians to live a generous life. Father, I pray that if there's anybody here today that has never said yes to you, that doesn't understand completely the generosity that you gave through your son, Jesus, God, that you would make it abundantly clear to them right now. God, that maybe for the first time, they would be grateful with thanksgiving, Lord, for the generosity of sending your son Jesus to take our place. God, that they would say yes to you, Father, and that their lives would be changed eternally. Lord, I pray that you would do the only work that you could do. Help us as we respond in worship to you. Let us be grateful. Let us be thankful. God, let us us see a wealth of righteousness in and through our lives because of the generosity. But more important, let us honor you in all that we do. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen.